Let's do it, baby. My man, are you ready to do this? Uh, I'm ready, man. You know, I have Absolutely. to tell I have to tell you, um, you're somebody I thought that I would have seen more of. Um, you know, uh, we lived you, you lived in the you lived in on Lafayette Street, I lived in Leonard yep. Street. Um, but somehow I think I kind of dipped out of tennis when you really uh, just kind of have been in it from, you know, every day, every week mm -hmm. for 35 you know, for, for your whole life. Um, how, about, how about 50 years 50 since I was years. three? 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, did you ever believe you'd be 25 years at ESPN? No, it, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, especially how it's, how it started. It was just kind of, um, you know, I fell into an opportunity. I had uh, done a little bit of broadcasting overseas, actually. Um, a guy by the name of Bill Threlfall, who was a great commentator who used to work for, uh, he was English, and he worked for the BBC, and he worked for a couple of different um, European networks. So, at that time, they were doing a lot of European tournaments, like with one announcer. So Bill, oftentimes, was the announcer. He was already a pretty, you know, been around a long time, older guy. But I just loved listening to him, and he invited me a couple of times. He used to invite just various players to come and do a match, you know, just to try to get someone else to talk to. And uh, so I, you know, raised my hand and did it with him, and... Um, then the next opportunity I got was actually, I believe, with USA Network when they were doing a similar thing at the U.S. Open. And uh, John was actually playing at that time. And, they, and I believe uh, it was, I think it was Ted Robinson and Vegas. Of course, I was, you know, Vegas was one of my heroes, et cetera. So they had me come on and do a set during one of John's matches. Um, and so that sort of led to me getting an opportunity with ESPN shortly thereafter. Gentlemen, you hear is former world number 28, former world number three in doubles, um, Stanford graduate, and, you know, on some level broadcaster, former Davis Cup captain, uh, former head of USTA player, pro player development, and the brother of one of the most famous people on the earth, my man, um, old friend of mine, Patrick McEnroe, um, coming from his basement, man. Yeah. Well, listen, um, <laughs> you, you, Craig, have inspired me to get into this and to start my own podcast, which I did just in the last couple of weeks when this whole epidemic hit. And, uh, I then found out shortly thereafter that I was uh, positive for the virus myself. I've been having some kind of minor symptoms, you know, a couple of different ones, breathing issues, a little bit of coffee, a little bit of fever. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, I ended up here in my basement. Uh, I've been here for about a month. Luckily, just in the last week, I've been able to go back upstairs with my family with the, with the uh, gloves. Gloves, the gloves and the mask. Really? Um, I'm hoping to get the all clear that has cleared my system so I can, you know, go back to quote unquote normally being with my kids and wife. So while I've been down here, okay, I've been doing some Zoom webinars for our kids at our John McEnroe Tennis Academy, which has been great. So I figured out how to do that. I've rearranged my basement and my uh, office down here. Yeah. And then I had this podcast machine. That I've been talking to a podcast company, uh, Mudhouse Media, based up in Boston, for months, talking about this idea, my concept of what my podcast would be, which is essentially people that are very successful outside of tennis, but who love tennis and who are obsessed with tennis. So I uh, saw this machine. I said, you know, now might be a decent time to figure out how to get this thing together. So, so listen. I did. So, so I've been knocking them out for the last couple of weeks. So we do a five set format, as you know, and the first yeah. set is the off the court report. Uh, as you just said, you've been way off the court. Um, I want to just dial right into this. Do you have any kind of feel for how you may have caught the virus? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I'm guessing just based on 
where I was at, at our tennis academy, which is on Randall's Island, yeah. you know, just, just north of Manhattan. Um, you know, we got tons of kids coming through there every day, tons of people, lots of coaches. Um, you know, obviously most kids, knock on wood, luckily don't get really sick from it. Um, at least that's what the current theories are. Um, but they may have it. So when you right. got so when you got sick, did you feel like oh this is different? <laughs> this is um you know the first the first thing I started noticing was I was really having trouble sleeping at night for a few nights in a row, and uh, that's pretty unusual. I'm usually a pretty good sleeper. I you know usually go to bed and you know need my seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, and I just was like waking up in the night, and at first I thought well. Obviously, this was just starting to happen, meaning we were shutting down, you know, New York, shutting down our academy, what was going to happen. So I thought it was just stress, you know, just that which many of us are going through. And I was thinking about my kids and my wife and, you know, what, how is this going to play out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So th- but then uh, after a couple of days, um, I we had dinner, I remember, on a Saturday night with my kids and my wife. My kids were already, like, in full lockdown. You know, they started homeschooling, uh, you know, online schooling um, in our town up here in Westchester. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I just don't feel right. You know, I said, well, I think we should take my temperature. So we took my temperature, and sure enough, I had a fever. So combined with the other uh, symptoms I had, that was when... We said, we got to, you know, put me in the basement. So we, my wife and I have sort of talked about it. Um, luckily, we do have a space down here where I've got to pull out bed, and there's a bathroom, no shower. So I always have to go up once every few days with everything on, you know, to take a shower. Um, but uh, as I said, I've been pretty lucky because my symptoms have never been extreme to where I thought, oh, my God, like I'm in trouble or I need to go to the doctor or the hospital. Because uh, I've spoken to a lot of people similar age to us, to me, that got it and really hit, got hit pretty hard, you know, as far as symptoms was. So you were communicating with some of your friends and, and people you know, comparing notes. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, there's a few other people that I knew that had it and, uh, you know, were getting pretty high fevers consistently and, you know, sweating profusely and, uh, obviously the breathing thing is the biggest, you know, the big concern. So I, I have felt at times that, um, I don't have my normal uh, strength in my lungs, you know, which for me is being an athlete and, you know, I've kept myself in pretty decent shape over the years. So me, uh, to, you know, walk my dog who's here with me in the background and walk up a hill and get a little bit fatigued is very, you know, pretty strange. Not to mention that as I started doing these podcasts, as you know, Craig, when you start talking a lot, um, I noticed like losing my breath a little bit uh, doing the podcast. So that led, has led me to believe that, um, you know, it's still hanging around. Um, so I'm, you know, taking extra precautions with the family. Now, um, do you have any um, opinion of leadership in New York um, and and through this in general? Well, I think Cuomo's done a great job. I mean, I think he's, you know, right from the beginning, he's been out in front of it and uh, doing the best he can seemingly in, you know, it's incredibly difficult situation, especially for the city. So where, you know, I, I live pretty close to when the first outbreak happened in New Rochelle um, when it, before it really even hit the city. So uh, I think he's done a good job of keeping everybody posted and being, you know, upfront and honest about what's going on. That's all you can do. Um, you know, it's been, I mean, it's rough. It's been rough here in this area. Um, as I said, a lot of friends and people I know have got it. And uh, even, you know, some, some friends of mine have lost some people that have, have lost their lives. So it's been, uh, it's been a pretty eye-opening experience. I mean, we all obviously are dealing with it all, everywhere. And we're just trying to get through it. Let's move into our second set. This is the on the court report. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, your your uh, perspectives on 
what has transpired what what has transpired since Indian Wells canceled. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you look back because everyone was shocked when that happened. I was I was literally getting ready to, you know, go on a plane to go out there to do some things with BNP Paribas, which actually sponsors our scholarship kids at our tennis academy, and then obviously to participate um, in the event itself. Actually, I wasn't actually supposed to do the broadcasting for ESPN, which I normally do, because I was taking my wife and my kids to Greece for her 50th birthday. My wife, shh, don't tell anyone, my wife just turned 50. Uh, we were going on a family show. Of course, all that got canceled, and you know, people were sort of surprised Wow, like this was you know, this was this is kind of a big deal. This it, 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 that was really the first big professional sporting event that pulled the plug in in our country. So uh, it turned out that uh, they were ahead of the curve, so to speak. They had a couple of um, uh, reports, I guess, at the hospital in the Palm Springs area of people getting it. And you know, I think California has done a pretty good job of being way out in front of it because you you certainly don't see the cases like. You see in New York City, which obviously people are living on top of each other. So things have, you know, have moved quickly. Um, obviously, when Wimbledon announced that they were canceling, that was a shot in the gut to all of us in the tennis world, kind of knowing that this is going to be a while. And uh, I happen to think that the U.S. Open is, is at this point turning into more of a long shot to happen, at least certainly with with the normal amount of fans. Uh, no. The problem for professional tennis, obviously, is that we're coming, you know, broadcasters, fans, players are coming from all over the world. So the only way for professional tennis to really get back um, to what, you know, some sense of normalcy is that the whole entire world has to be reopened. And, and I think it's a little e easy, not easy, it's a little more manageable country by country to do things, you know, city by city, state by state. But worldwide is what it would take for tennis to come back. So I think that's going to make it very difficult to see any tennis uh, professional at the highest level in this year. If you take, uh, have you had any, my, our show, we pride ourselves on being a bit of an insider show. Have you had any interesting conversations with any behind the sceneers that have given you some perspective that maybe we don't know about? Well, I think that, um, obviously, I think the issue of uh, doing it with limited fans at the U.S. Open has come up. Uh, you know, I do think there's some concern amongst the tennis organizations that, uh, you know, obviously everybody's struggling all over the world. I mean, millions of people have lost their jobs, including a lot of our pros at our tennis academy, you know, teaching pros and people that work in the clubs. So that's happening on a global scale. But, you know, tennis players are people, too. Right. You know, professional tennis players. And obviously we're not talking about Serena and Roger and Rafa as far as struggling financially. But we are talking about a lot of players, you know, that are ranked between, you know, 100 and 2000, you know, men and women that are that I think really are struggling. So I'm hoping that uh, there'll be some way for the whether it's the majors, the tours to get together and, you know, maybe give these players some loans. I've heard the PGA is uh, talking about doing that or maybe has done that already. Uh, I think that's that's an issue for professional tennis players, not to mention all the people that work in the tennis world, the tennis industry, you know, whether they're people in TV like us, um, you know, a lot of those people who work for ESPN or for the big net networks are not um, contract employers for the whole year. So they come in and they count on these events throughout the course of the year. So those people are struggling as well. Um, if there's a way that tennis could be played, safely obviously and 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 for television uh i think that would be a positive but remember tennis unlike a lot of the bigger you know the bigger team sports of our country football basketball hockey etc rely far more heavily on uh, daily attendance to pay their bills and to satisfy the sponsors to pay the players than the other sports and then tv revenue for example you know the nfl obviously and, and uh, nba you know, a, a much higher percentage of their income, of their revenues, come from television than they do from the from the the daily gate. The so for tennis, it's a little trickier. Um, uh, one of the things that I I found interesting has been the emergence of Andrea Gaudenzi as a uh, as a real deal 
or at the very least, he sounded like the real deal. Um, in his presser uh, a few days ago, um, do you know him? Can you talk about him? Uh, you know, I know him reasonably well. I mean, I played with him on the tour. Uh, he was a, he's a little bit younger than me, but he was on the tour when I was out there. Always, uh, you know, had a lot of respect for him as a player, as a competitor. He's a very hard worker. Um, you know, not the most gifted player, but a hell of a competitor and extremely fit. And, smart, and obviously a smart guy. So, you know, I was unaware of, of how impressive his resume has been since he left tennis, right. you know, and went on to have a real career in the business world. So I think that's that's pretty, you know, I always knew he was a smart guy, um, but he's sort of taken that to another level. So I agree with you. I'm, I've been really, I mean, I was really liked him as a player, a good guy, smart guy, but to see what he's done and to see the way he's kind of stepped into, I mean, who the heck could have um, predicted something like this, and all of a sudden he steps into this world where, um, you know, the, 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 the past problems seem minuscule, you know, as far as the, the tour dealing with the majors and players splinter in different directions. So now you've got this global crisis. So uh, it seems like he's, he's, he's handling it well so far. And I hope that he could be a strong voice for the players, you know, particularly the, the non-top, top players that need help through this process. And, and, and also, it seems like he's taking this opportunity to look at all the problems we've known to have, have, have existed at tennis and how do we come to some, you know, better organization uh, for professional tennis in general. He spoke to, and I guess there's been some initiatives with the men and the women uh, together. Um, that felt like really good <laughs> to me um, in general. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look, look, obviously look at the majors and look at the big, you know, masters events, the men, you know, we're the only sport, we tennis, we're the only sport really where men and women are on, on equal footing and uh, essential. Okay, there's some, you know, cracks here and there, obviously, but you have to, I think, and as a former male player, I can understand how sometimes the male players get a little bit upset about that, right? Because if you look at the men's tour, essentially just by itself in the women's store, the men's store brings in more revenue. Okay. But I think you have to look at like the overall good and the overall good is the majors are huge. Keep getting bigger and better. So do the masters events. Why not bring the rest of the tours together? No doubt. I mean, because that's actually helping the overall economics. So you could say if you were a hardcore guy, like, hey, the you know, women, you know, shouldn't play alongside us. But I think you're losing sight then of the bigger picture, which is that, first of all, it's a great thing to do culture, culturally. And it's the right message to send. And we should be very proud of ourselves in the tennis world that we can send that message legitimately. And why not keep going in that direction? Because people like fans... You know, when I go to tournaments, fans love the fact that they can see men and women no you know, and playing. It's, it's great for the sport. So I think, to me, maybe this is an opportunity for the men's and women's tour and women's tour to actually start to come together more. And to that point, when Nick Kyrgios practices with uh, Amanda Anisimova, it draws a bigger crowd than yeah. any other, you know, round of 32 match there is, man. <laughs> well, you know, women, look, women and men um, can, can, can successfully practice with each other you know, 100%. In, a certain, in a certain uh, situation. So, like you said, you know, people love that. It's great for the morale of the sport. It's a great message to send to kids out there. Um, and I think it's something that there, it doesn't exist. I mean, it does, okay, the Olympics, Olympics it exists, right, as far as, you know, that you're in a team representing your country, but there's really no other sport, even golf, um, you know, which is kind of had it, you know, could do it theoretically because they're not playing against women per se, um, hasn't really capitalized on it to me the same way, certainly nowhere close to what tennis has been able to do. Let's move into our third set. This is the portion of our show where we talk about your career. Man, I, I have to ask you, now that we're of this sort of advanced age and you look back and you kind of close your eyes, what was it like to have that front row seat 
in the player's box, at practice, I can only imagine, at the kitchen table, when you were, you know, 10 and John was 17, man. What was that like? Um, you know, it's funny because um, it seemed kind of normal at the time because that was like when you're a kid, and now that I see it with my three children, um, you know, kind of whatever's happening around you, you just think it's normal, like it, that's just your life. So, for example, when, um, you know, the TV news crews started coming to our house in Douglaston when John made the semis at Wimbledon, you know, as a qualifier, as a teenager, you know, it seemed kind of cool. Like, oh, this is kind of fun, you know. And of course, we look back and we say, why in the world did we let all these news crews in our house? You know, like, we would never do that after being around it for a couple of years, et cetera. So, um, you know, obviously, tennis was always a big part of growing up for us, for both of us. And you have um, an old, uh, just, you have, there's another brother, and he can yeah, play. Mark. And he yeah. can play. He can play pretty well. He's actually a really, really solid player, but he never got into playing competitive. So he never really got, you know, he was, um, he's in the middle of me and John. John's the oldest, and Mark was, oh. a, was a solid player. But he had, like, one older brother who was really good. <laughs> and he had a younger brother coming up who was getting pretty good. And I used to play with him a lot because we were, you know, as I got to be maybe 11, 12, you know, he was 13. He's, like, four years older than me. So when I, you know, he could tell that I was starting to get to where I was probably going to beat him soon, you know, so... Yeah. He was like, I can't, you know, I'm not going to, he's not going to put himself in tournaments to deal with that. Obviously, John was already, you know, one of the top players in the country. And Mark had other interests. He was into basketball and different things. But, it, but tennis was really so much a part of what we did. So when John made it, like, big, um, it didn't seem like that unusual. Obviously, looking back, someone sent me a video actually yesterday of, of John hitting at the French Open, like, warming up for one of his big matches and then they 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 uh they moved over to the other side he was hitting with me and i'm like i don't i don't remember that you know like i was warming you know, probably warming him up for like a huge match at the friend i used to, you know i used to drive him to the u.s open when he was in his heyday like in the mid 80s early to mid 80s um i used to drive him from our house in in, in Long Island because we, we he bought us like this big pad that had a tennis court <laughs> meeting for the whole family. Yeah, we used to hit in the morning. John and I would practice, and then we I would drive him into the open for the for like the big matches. And we had a total routine. He had this bought this 450 SL. It was his first car he ever bought, Mercedes, with it, with his earnings. So he kept that forever. We used to hit. We used to get. I used to drive, and he used to nap. On the 45-minute drive into Flush Fl Meadows, every time was like clockwork. So that was like our routine. Like I would, we'd warm up, play for 45 minutes. You know, he didn't want to deal with the crowd and the practice sports, and then he would just like just be, you know, start locking in mentally, get ready for the matches. And so that was kind of like that was my life, you know. How um, important was your father? I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm just closing my doors. Yep. I'll wait. How important was your father to the whole program? You Well, he was he was he was um I'm not going to say he was the driving force, but he was the driver. Like he drove us. My mom was probably more like the drive. My mom was pretty like intense. You know, she was kind of hardcore, like, um, you know, when my dad always liked to tell the story when he when he was uh, working during the day when they had just gotten married. They were in their early 20s, and he had a job working as, like, in a law firm, He and he was going to law school at night. He would go to law school at night and work during the day. My mom was a nurse, an emergency room nurse for many years. So they lived in, like, you know, an apartment in Flushing. That was their first place they lived. My dad came home um, very excited one one uh, one day at the end of the school year and said, "Kay, my mom's name was Kay." She said, "He said, Kay, uh, I finished number two in my class," and she said, "Oh, really? Who finished one?" 
So that was kind of like, um, you know, a little bit of, she was, you know, she drove us pretty hard, especially John, him being the first, and obviously the most, most talented tennis-wise. So, uh, but my dad, um, my dad loved him. Like, he loved, you know, being the dad to John McEnroe and, and then me and being involved in Davis Cup. And, you know, that was his favorite thing in the world was Davis Cup. He loved that. And he loved to be around it. But, you know, he used to drive me to all the tournaments when I was a kid. Um, and, um, you know, he liked to say he was very proud of the fact that uh, when I was a junior, you know, here in the East, growing up in the East, I was always, you know, one of the top juniors in the East. And I had a great record, so he told me, in, in three set matches, you know, that, that went the distance. So he was very proud of the advice he would give me in between sets. Because in those days, you could get like a 10-minute break sure. and coaching. So he would always say to me, son, do what you did in the set you won, <laughs> not the set you lost. <laughs> like, you can't go wrong with that advice, right? So he really, he really enjoyed it um, in a way that, uh, um, you know, he was he had a lot of pride in, in what we did and, and but more than just the playing part. I mean he loved the playing part, but he just he lo you know, especially loved uh, you know, when we started working together in T V, you know, that was really cool for that was great for me. That was something I always wanted to do was to try to work with John on T V, which is part of the reason I try to develop, you know, other skills other than just being an analyst. Yeah. And finally that came to fruition. So I think he was he was pretty pumped up about that too. You know, I, I wrote a story, uh, like a 3,500-word story for Racket Magazine, who I know you sure. know. And, and, it was about, yeah. and it was about Martin Mulligan. And mm -hmm. he told me a story about how John loved Fila because of Borg, and he was wearing Fila, and that he was dealing with your father mm. when John was, like, at Stanford wearing right. Did your dad sort of operate as the agent for a moment, or? Did... Oh, definitely. No, no, he operated for an, uh, our agent for a long time. In fact, and probably in retrospect, too long. You know, because I think it, it, you know, for, especially with John, you know, because they butted heads a lot. My dad had, you know, in some ways a similar personality to John, um, but for a good part of John's career. You know, my dad, you know, John always had like an Asian and tennis person. Um, but my dad was always like the guy overseeing it. You know, he was a lawyer by trade. So he was, you know, very good at way better than most of our agents ever could have been about reading contracts and specifying stuff because that's what he did for a living. So uh, there did come a time where I think John especially felt that, you know, it was, it was, it was tough on their father son relationship. That, that was continuing. So that's sort of, he started to wean off that like later in his career. But, you know, I always appreciated, obviously I didn't have the kind of money that John did. Um, so it was nice to have my dad, you know, helping me out with stuff and not having to pay him. Uh, and, but, but he always, you know, even, even later in my career, like when I started to get into broadcasting and started to kind of do my own deals with my agent, with, with ESPN or whomever, um, you know, my dad always wanted, let me see the contract, you know, let me go over the contract. Yeah. And of course that would, that would make my agents, you know, nervous as could be he's like, here we go. Yeah. But, but he, he certainly had our best interest at heart. No doubt about it. Last question. The last thing about your father, you got to just tell the story about him chasing down a bandit in the subway. That happened, didn't it? Didn't your that father did happen? Your yeah, father did happen. Um, he was a bit older at the time. So I don't think he could catch him, but uh, he was pretty—he was pretty pissed off about it, and uh, we were a little worried about him because, uh, you know, I think he was, you know, trying to run up the subway steps. And I'm going to say he was in his early 70s at that point when that happened. You know, he passed away in his early 80s, um, and so he was, you know, he was struggling a bit physically. But he was a, you know, he was a New Yorker through and through. My dad. I mean, he grew up in the Upper East Side, Irish immigrant family. Only child, you know, playing stickball, playing handball in the streets, and he used to like to say that that's where we got our hand-eye coordination, you know, his uh, handball, because he, you know, he didn't have the money to play tennis or yeah. sports like that. So um, I think he was really proud of where he came from, obviously, and you know, giving us the opportunities that we got, even when 
my dad, my mom had no money at all. Um, they they got us to go to you know the private school and basically took out a loan. You know, told them they'd pay them back, pay the school back years later, which they did. So they were always looking to try to you know give us the things that they couldn't have when they were growing up. Um, you know, you distinguished yourself as a top junior in the country. Um, what was how would you describe your career and how did you, and how did you decide to turn pro? You know? yeah, good question. I mean, it was, um, you know, I was, a, I was a very successful junior. Um, I certainly considered slightly at times like, do I, should I not go to college? But I never really considered that seriously. Um, if I had, uh, I think I probably would have had a slightly better tennis career because I didn't really understand what it took to make it at the pros until I left college. You know, it's okay, funny. It's, um, Chuck yeah. Adams, uh, me, me, Chuck Adams, Michael Joyce, and Jeff Tarango were on a text uh, texting string, and they were giving Jeff shit. They said, you know, you got soft at college. Because he was mm. really one of the right. best juniors there right. ever was. Right. And they were kind of yeah. giving him a hard time. And and Chuck really believed that. That, you know, you ain't going to you ain't gonna beat a guy from Bulgaria who's fighting for his life coming out of, <laughs> coming out of Stanford. It's going to take yeah, a so minute. I, uh, yeah, I think it would have, you know, probably, I think I looked at it in the, in the right way, which is I'm probably, you know, not, not like John, you know, people forget John was already top 30 in the world when he went to Stanford. Okay. <laughs> so, so imagine that happening or anything like that today would, you know, my mom just said like, you're going to Stanford cause you're going for a year. You're just going to go. So is that what I it was? was your about... mother just forced him said you're going to college for a year. That's it. Yeah. That 100%. Was it. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody knew that he was going to make a lot of money and that he was going to be, you know, a top player in the world. That was already obvious. So for me, it was, that wasn't obvious. So can I say, sit here and say, you know, if I had gone all in as a professional player at 17, 18, I think I probably would have gotten a little bit higher. You know, I maybe could have gotten to the top 20, maybe 15 in the world. Um, but that was not a guarantee. So obviously getting an education, um, getting a degree, going to college, that experience, first of all, um, was amazing. And I think uh, it'd be crazy for me to say that my other opportunities that I've gotten, you know, in the tennis world, but outside of playing, you know, working for the USDA, being Davis Cup captain, head of player development, getting into broadcasting, doing my own radio show, et cetera. Of course, I could have done that just by being a former tennis player. But uh, I think that having that education certainly helped. So while, you know, I think the payoff of me having just going straight to the pros probably I feel like I still made the right decision going to college, even though my, my tennis in college, I think somewhat stagnated the last couple of years I was there. I know you are a believer in college tennis. Oh, I love college tennis. I mean, college is, uh, you know, you have to, you have to work harder as an individual player to make it, um, a preparation for the pros. That's the key. College tennis is for 99% of junior tennis players is the way to go because you're very unlikely to make a living playing tennis. College tennis is uh, awesome. I mean, it's yeah. so much fun. It's so much fun. Yeah, it's a great atmosphere. And but to, but if you if you want to be a professional player, then you have to really do a lot on your own while you're in college because the college system is not set up to prepare you for the pros necessarily. But, I mean, it, it can if you're a top guy. If you're Steve Johnson and you're playing number one at USC or at Stanford or something like that, you know, you're playing good competition. But you, even Steve Johnson, as, as great a college player as he was, you know, it took him a while to figure out, okay, like when I go to the pros, I got to take my fitness to the next level. I got to take my training. I got to take everything to the next level, which he was able to do. 
you know, is there obviously a little bit of an exception just because of his his size and his game style? Because it's served. But for yeah, but when you look at a, a lot of really really top college players, when they left college, couldn't make it to the pros. It's like almost like Kevin Anderson and Isner are exceptions to the rule because of elite size and elite serves. Really, they they can hold serve. Yeah, they can hold serve, and then that you know that give that gave them a little time to sort of figure out what else they needed to do to get better. You know, to be to be great pro players, which they both become. Um, how would you describe your pro career? I think I maxed out. I mean, I think, as I said, I think I could have done a little better earlier if I'd been in, you know, better condition when I first got out of college. I was, you know, woefully out of shape um, compared to the to the pro level. So it took me like two years to figure out what I needed to do to be like a decent singles player. Obviously, I had very good double skills. If I had focused only on doubles, you know, or more on doubles, I think I could have won more, you know, titles in doubles. But at the same time, I wanted to, like, you know, be, try to become a legitimate singles player. So uh, that hurt me early on being, you know, good in doubles. But doubles was sort of paying my bills for a couple of years. So I think that, you know, I found that balance. Um, but I think that overall, you know, when I look at my results, you know, my better results overall were actually in bigger tournaments, in, in the majors. I think because I was fitter, you know, I worked hard. I wasn't you know, the naturally most explosive type player. So, um, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I felt like my best results in my career came in some, you know, some of the majors. You know, you mentioned when you spoke to Renee and Caitlin that Dickie Herbst was a a profound uh, coach for you, that he really got the best out of you. And when I met you, it was probably like around the clay court season, 1996. I think you were probably top 30. Then you precipitously mm-hmm. fell off by 98. You were off the tour. Generally speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk about who Dickie was and, and sort of what happened to you at that moment in time. Well, I was off the tour basically because I had got injured. So okay. I had a couple of shoulder surgeries, okay. 98, 99. Yeah. And that's sort of ended my career. But Dickie was, um, sort of uh, a, a, a longtime friend. He coached one of my best friends growing up, um, Paul Palangian, who played at Harvard and, you know, had a little bit of a stint on the tour. His brother Peter played a little bit on the tour as well. Dickie's a uh, Massachusetts guy, right? Yeah, he's originally from Massachusetts. So he's, um, so that's where he grew up. He spent some time, I know, working with May out at one point. He was a big um, sort of cohort of Dave Fish, who was a coach at Harvard yeah. for you know, many, many years. So Dickie was from that that area and so I came to know him through my my friends and so I'd known him for a number of years and you know he just kind of reorganized my game a little bit he 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 had a lot of belief in me he got me practicing with better players more often he got me using you know I think understanding my strength which was my backhand how to set up my backhand he was big into patterns and you know playing specific patterns Oh, uh, what's an example? Was, what's an example yeah. of that? Um, that how did he bring the sort of that that really change in strategy? Right, you're, you're you're all of a sudden he's talking about patterns to you. What like what would he say? What's an example? Well, he would say like you know why why would you know I get a mid you know a, a rally ball in the forehand and most people say you, know, you hit that cross court that's a safe shot and he would say well, well you know how do you want to play this point. I said, well, I, you know, like to freaking hit a backhand, like a rip a backhand. He said, well, then let's work on your forehand down the line, you know, a little bit higher with shape, you know, to your opponent's backhand, assuming they're righty, because the odds are the next ball is going to come to your backhand. So, like, things like that, using your serve, you know, I didn't have a big serve, but use your serve so that the likelihood is you're going to get a backhand on their, your first shot, you know, like you see all the players do now, serve plus one, they're looking for the big forehand for the most part, so I think he sort of, um, he kind of put that into my mindset a little bit, where, you know, I, I it wasn't like I wasn't a smart player, because I think I was, which is part of the reason I was, I was pretty good, but, you know, I wasn't that quick, um, you know, I couldn't defend that well, so I had to, you know, just try to play as much offense early on in the point as I could, so he's like, why are you going forehand, cross court, cross court, when, 
you know, you might as well take the first or second ball off the line so you can then get it back in and, you know, get control of the point earlier. So it was like kind of little things like that. Um, but it was also a mindset and just a belief that, um, you know, you can play with these guys. You can play with the top guys in the world. So part of uh, what he did was try to change my mindset, which is why he started getting me to practice with, you know, better players more often. Dickie Herbst, man, that ain't no joke. You got to 28. That's not, that's, that's, I mean, well, he, was, he, was, he was there when I made my run at the U.S. Open when yeah. I got to the quarters, which was, you know, I, I had success early in the 90s when I did the semis of the Australian, and, you know, I was kind of in and out of the top 30, top 40, so doing pretty well. Uh, made a couple of finals of some tournaments, but 95 that year, Dickie sort of really helped me kind of get over the hump at the Open because that was, you know, obviously a place – where I thought over the years I should have done better because hardcore was my best surface. It was relatively quick conditions, usually my hometown, all that stuff. So he was kind of there for me in that run. And so that was, you know, one of the great runs for me because it was, you know, I had a couple of nice comeback wins in that tournament. And then even though I lost to Becker in the quarters in a four setter, I really felt like I probably played the best, one of the best matches I ever played you know, in that match just to keep it, you know, keep it that close. And I was very close to turning that match around and taking it to the fifth set. Um, last question about your brother. Um, what are your memories of 1984? I mean, the guy lost, I think, three matches. Uh, were you Were you front and center for a lot of that year? Were you around? Were you... What were you doing well, then? I was I was playing junior a big you know big all the big tournaments and did juniors that year. So it was obviously an unbelievable year. Let me John. stop you. Let me stop you just quickly for our listeners. In 1984, John McEnroe basically I think went 84 and three and won three of the slams and didn't play off. Uh, sorry, he lost the French to Lendl. Right, and it's considered. Psh, you know, probably one of the great years of an athlete there ever was, period. Continue. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's certainly up there with, the, you know, the greatest single years in tennis. I know Federer had a, a year where he, I think, had four losses and maybe five or six, a couple of, so Federer had more, you know, longevity, consistency, but that year for John was, uh, was tremendous. That's when he obviously dominated the Wimbledon final, um, who did he play in '84? Was it? Uh, I don't know. Was it? Was it? It might have been Chris Lewis in '84, huh. which was just a complete beatdown. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, but I'll tell you what I remember, on, on, which unfortunately, you know, John remembers probably better than any is the loss to Lendl. Yeah. Because um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Craig, but I was playing in the Junior French Open at the same time, and I was in the Junior Doubles final. Okay, the same day as the men's final, John against Lendl. So I was playing with Luke Jensen, um, and we had won. We actually were going to go on and win Kalamazoo that year, our junior nationals. And we were playing, guess who, in the finals of the junior doubles? Udo Rugleski and Boris Becker. Okay? <laughs> and Becker was like 15. So we were in the locker room. And John was destroying Lendl up two sets to love and a break in the third. And the referee from the French Open came into the locker room and said, um, hey, we're going to put you guys on center court because we were scheduled to go on the other court. Amazing, right? yeah. And it, but the match was going so fast that they said, we're just going to put, you know, we need another match. We're going to put you on center court. And I'm like, can you believe this? Like my brother's going to win the French and I'm going to go, I'm going to get the play like right after him. This is amazing. And my parents had flown over that morning just for the final. They'd come over on the, you know, the, the red eye arrived that morning. They're in the crowd. And of course, you know, the shit starts to hit the fan. John loses it. A couple of photographers loses the third set. Still very, very much in it in the fourth set. Did he run out of gas? I, you know, he didn't run out of gas until the end. I mean, maybe, maybe midway through the fourth, he started getting tired. But I think it was, uh, you know, it was one of those things where you're, you're, you're right there. You're so close, and and he will say to this day, that's you know, that one stings more than any other. Um, so, 
just to finish this, that yeah. quick story, and then I'll tell you another story what happened after. But I, so they finally put, they, they waited till the four set was over. To move and then with two sets all, they moved us to the other court. So now I'm like, I got to go out and play the junior doubles final. There's like seven people in the crowd, you know, Boris's coach and maybe a USDA coach for us. I don't even remember. And uh, I'm listening to the score, you know, like, and I'm like, oh, man. So, he, of course, he loses 7-5 in the fifth, right? Um, and I see my parents, like, a game or two later, come walking into my court. And they're like, they're like, you know, white as a ghost. And I'm like, can you? So I ended up winning that match. And so we said the McEnroe's went one and one that day. But I think we would have taken the reverse uh, of that. But the, the, but the last piece of this story, which I think t tells you a lot about John and also the mindset of, of, of a great champion that he was, um, I said to him later that night, we were all out. Peter Fleming, I think, was there, too, his good buddy, his doubles partner. And me being, you know, a 17-year-old kid, I, what do I know? And I said, ah, oh, John, you know, don't worry about it, man. You're going to get another chance. You know, you're going to win this thing. And he's like, that was my shot. He goes, that was my chance. He goes, and I think he knew he was never going to get that chance again. You know, he was, he was going to win Wimbledon. He was going to win the U.S. Open. But at the French, you know, everything was clicking. And he knew that overall, you know, Lendl, V. Lander, those guys were, were better clay court players. And um, that, to me, said a lot about, like, you know, I learned from him later in my career when we started playing some double, more doubles together and doing well. Like, that ability to, like, just, like, we got to do it now. Like, we, this is it. Like, this is the moment. You got to grab the moment right now. And he, he had that sort of intensity, which is incredible, because I think Borg was similar in that way. And that's, in some ways, why Borg just left so quickly when he, he was like, okay, like, McEnroe's beating me. Now I'm out of here. Which is why it's more amazing when you look at this group of great players that we've seen the last 10, 15 years, Roger, Rafa, Novak, that they sort of have had a lot of these similar type losses, but yet they they move on and they keep going. And they don't look at it like that was my only chance. They keep coming back. So I think that it said a lot about that time with my brother and kind of what his mindset, but how the mindset of these great players has sort of evolved. Did 1984 break him? Well, I think it, you know, it, he still was, um, he still was right there at the top. But if you look at, uh, you know, his majors, et cetera, I think um, it, I'm not sure it broke him, but, you know, it was definitely the end of his run as far as being number one and dominant. My, in my storyteller mind, it's like the quest for perfection because he was just such a, Really, he's really an artist. Um, it's different than others. And that quest for perfection, like, it took all his energy. Is that yeah, I think, that, I, and I think there's some truth to that. I mean, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, because he was, as I said, it was so, he was so close there at, at the French. You know, that was the one he wanted to win. And, and, you, and as you noted, which we should all remember, when you look at um, the total number of majors, right, Borg and my brother, they could care less about the Australian Open in those years. They, they didn't even play it. John only played it, like, later in his career. You know, Connors played it a little bit, um, you know, more sporadically. But for those guys, the top players, it was an afterthought. So it almost you wasn't. Like Borg's, got Borg's got 11 majors. I mean, imagine John has yeah. seven. If he had played the Australian every year. <laughs> yeah. It also wasn't a real thing, the Australian man. You wouldn't no. go over there, no. No, it was a different. It was a different deal. Let's move into our fourth set. This is okay. the this is the ten ball scramble. We do not do a deep dive. I say it, and you say what comes in your mind. You ready? Okay. Favorite tournament. Australian Open. Favorite court. Center court, Wimbledon. Favorite city. Other than New York, because that's my uh, probably Paris. New York and Paris. Yeah. Where do you keep your trophies? Scattered uh, throughout my house. I got quite a few in my basement, actually. 
<laughs> Where do you keep your uh, sorry? Do you keep your credentials? Yes, yes I, I do, do. and they're a box. Just a box. And my wife keeps saying, like, one day you're, I'm going to do something, or you should do something. They're still in the box. <laughs> you got them from the whole your whole life. Uh, you box. know, I'm going to say it's more from like my latter years of playing and then broadcasting. Big entourage or lean and mean? I couldn't afford big entourage. Very lean. Very lean. Do you, um, what are your opinions about that question? Uh, big entourage or lean and mean? Do you, are you a fan of the big entourage? I mean, I'm not a huge fan, but I'm, uh, but it is what it is. You know, I don't, I don't like, I don't read too much into it. It's sort of the nature of the, of the beast. I used to, I used to laugh like when in, uh, watching college basketball games, you know, yeah. and they're, they're, you know, you have these, these legendary coaches. It's like four guys. You know, I said, there's only five people playing. My there's man, like there's, guys. there's more you know? coaches than players. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I mean, so, you know, football, I sort of get it because, uh, you know, there's so many different, like, areas. But, um, you know, <laughs> tennis, it's, it's, tennis is funny now. It's becoming like, now you can't, if you're a top player, it's not good enough. Just now you can't even have one coach. You have to have two coaches. So talk about the rich getting richer. Davis Cup. Love it. I mean, unbelievable. My greatest professional experience in my life, winning the Davis Cup as a captain. Labor Cup. Uh, awesome event. So much fun. I mean, players players love it. Huge passion. Um, it's, tennis needs more of that. What is what, what do people like? What do fans like? Don Imus. Radio legend, but, uh, you know, had his quirks. I, I wanted to ask you about that, though. I felt, uh, for our listeners, Patrick, as he was coming up in broadcasting, did the did the sports on the IMIS show. Yep. You know, I have to tell you, I'm, I, I didn't listen to a lot of it when you did that because I always listen to radio when I'm driving, and I lived in New York, and I didn't drive, obviously. But... Mm -hmm. um, I felt like you got a lot of reps on that show. Did 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 that help you improve? Oh, definitely. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, you had to be incredibly organized with what you were going to say. So every word counted because you didn't have a lot of – you wouldn't give you a lot of time. And if you didn't like what you were doing, he'd give you less time. So it was almost like you had to be entertaining. You had to get to the point. You had to be energetic just to get time, you know, just to be able to get on. Um, so you always had to be, like, very prepared, but you also had to be prepared to go in any direction imaginable. So I would have, you know, pages of stuff written out, like the report of what happened in the Nick game or what happened in this game, and a lot of times you wouldn't even get to because he might just come up and just, you know, throw anything out there. So you, it was this balance of having to really be prepared because there's sometimes when he would throw to you and he would leave and go to the bathroom. So that's, and, and it's like, okay, you got three minutes on your own. Yeah. And then there were times when he would say, Macro, what do you, know, who the hell cares about this? This is terrible. You know, and I so felt, you had to be prepared for anything. I felt like he also, I, the, the times I heard him once, I felt like he would like call you like a twerp and like the second Macro oh, yeah. and like just torture you. Yeah, well, he did that to everybody. So you, you didn't, I didn't take that too personally um but that was sort of his shtick you know, that was that's his shtick that was his shtick and uh but in a way um you could tell if he liked you and he did yeah. like me he liked him actually my dad was a huge fan of his and my dad actually helped me get the audition you know which i did like a live audition he was auditioning people he was looking for somebody new to come in yeah so um you know i went in there just basically like on a lark <laughs> and um you know, he, you know, I had the job, so I did it for almost two years. Um, ESPN's tennis coverage. Last question. Well, um, I think it's come a long way. You know, we've mm -hmm. always, uh, you know, I was there from the beginning, meaning, well, the beginning, not the beginning, but the beginning, you know, as far as ESPN really getting heavily into the majors. You know, so we used to go and do the Australian Open 
And we laugh about it now because now we have this amazing crew of, you know, over what well, we did, at least until a couple of years ago, you know, over 100 people uh, that would fly over from the U.S. And when we I started out, it was, you know, me, Cliff Drysdale, Bob Feller, and Bob Rosper, you know, yeah. two announcers, the producer, and the director. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, before that, obviously, you know, Fiery Fred was, was great. That was how I started doing doing courtside for them. So I think, um, you know, ESPN started kind of doing it on the fly. We used to do seven days at the, all the Masters events. So And then I was transitioning to, you know, being the big network covering it. So I think you know, obviously there's the economics and, you know, the, the usual, which is how do you serve the real tennis fans that don't want to see Serena and Roger up, you know, 6-1, 4-up and show another match where it's two two relative unknowns playing a 4-5 or five setter or a women's match going the distance. So you kind of have to balance, like, to the real tennis fan, but then to the sports fan who, if they turn on their TV – and they see Serena, they're going to keep it on. And they're going to see Roger, they're going to keep it. They don't really care about the score. So I think we've kind of found a, a pretty good balance of trying to do both, you know, particularly those first weeks of the majors, um, to where, you know, obviously focusing on the stars because the stars obviously do sell the sport in general. Oh, you know, and by the way, man, if anyone has any real complaints, they should just run – they should run the tape back to '86. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for a yeah, tape exactly. for a tape yeah. delayed French Open final at 10 a.m. Yep. Uh, you know, the, you got every match there is on ESPN Plus, ESPN Three, yeah. ESPN yeah, Two. It's been, it's been it's been awesome for me because I've been there, as I said, you know, from when we started out with sort of a skeleton team, and now we've got you know so many different broadcasters and so many great people working in production that. I think, uh, you know, ESPN has put a lot of its muscle behind tennis, which, by the way, is great for tennis. You know, I still I still try to get us, you know, I'm always fighting with them to try to get us on Sports Center and on yeah. the radio shows more often. And usually it's a big controversy that, you know, they call me and say, can you come on a show? And, you know, I would like to see it happen more, but uh, I keep fighting the good fight to try to, you know, put tennis out there on, on the the overall network a little bit more. Let's move into our fifth and final set. This is the king of the court. Okay. If you were the king of tennis, and you've been you've been like sort of close in a way, I, I, I would say, but if you were the king of tennis and, and, and you could make a change in the sport with a swing of the racket without any real significant aggravation, what would it be? Well, um, you know, I think just talking in this, podcast with you i think that you know as i've thought about it through this global pandemic um i think that putting the men's and women's tours as one would be would be a good start um i've often thought that uh structuring tennis a little bit more like golf wherein there's a pga tour there's a basically a tour in the united states and then you know a european tour an asian tour that's something I think we should consider, although I, I'm not sure about that because, you know, tennis, what makes tennis great is its global nature. Obviously, the majors are the majors. You're going to move all everything around the majors. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of like it's already, in a way, it's already happening, you know, because the Federers and the Nadals of the world, you know, they're not going to come and play San Jose, you know, and, and, and those tournaments. So you know, those tournaments thrived back in the 80s because my brother played and Connors played and then Sampras and Agassi and Courier played. And, you know, that's what drives those mid-market events. Well, man, As opposed, you know, you know the, the majors and the masters events are now hugely successful. Goran said the same thing yesterday. He said they got to <laughs> figure out a way to, to get these bigger players and these big stars to play these to play these other events, man. Yeah, well, it's, it's all about money and economics, and uh, obviously they got to take care of themselves. But I would, I would like to see that be part of it. I like the, um, you know, the attention that we've had in the last year, two years with the team events. You know, the Labor Cup. I thought the AT, ATP Cup was successful. You know, the Davis Cup has always been been amazing. That's gone through some transition. 
Uh, but I do think that people like those, you know, and we, we in the tennis world have to look at what do people like? What do fans want? You know, so forgetting so much about, well, you know, this tournament's been here for so many years. Okay, great. I mean, be, uh, you know, I understand people get pissed off at the French Open. We're going to take the dates in September. Well, you know, in a way, part of me is like, okay, like, let's throw all this stuff up in the air and see where we all come down and see what the fans want. Um, and I think, like, the Labor Cup is a great example of putting something together that, yeah, you know, fans love. And so why, why get rid of that? I mean, you sold out in Prague. You sold out in Chicago. You sold out in Geneva. Um, you sell, we're going to sell out in Boston, although we just announced, they just announced today it's going to move to next year. But I think those are the kind of things that we have to find a way to keep in tennis. 100%. You know? 100%. Yeah. Hey, man. Um, um, I'm glad that you uh, are moving through the, uh, this COVID situation well. Um, uh, thank you for the time. Um, last thing, just, uh, the, the podcast, your, your focus is on the most interesting people you can find who love tennis. Is that right? Right. Yeah. That's, that's that, at least the initial, my initial series, you know, that, yeah. I'm, that I've been doing. So I've had some great, um, guests. Brian Koppelman was my first, you know, the guy who's co-created billions and some great movies. So he's a huge tennis fan. Alan Bergman, who's one of the great lyricists, songwriters of all time. By the way, the Bergman episode is bad to the bone, man. Oh, man. No, oh, I mean, man. so those kind of people, like his yeah. story of how he got into tennis just, you know, gave me the chills. Same uh, here. Yeah, so coming up, I've got uh, Dick Vitale, cool. who uh, loves tennis, and his, his kids and his grandkids all play at a really high level. So uh, he's an unbelievable um, supporter of tennis, and he hosts his own tournament, college tournament every year down in Florida. So that's coming up. Uh, ben Stiller, Fun. who plays a lot at our tennis academy. So I got to know him a little bit. You know, he's a, a fan of pro tennis, but he got into playing tennis um, like in his 40s. So I'm just like really impressed with people that um, – Got into tennis like even later in life because tennis is freaking hard to get good at. You know, that's the other thing I've learned in working with kids, especially at our academy, is that to get really good at tennis takes a lot of time and it's really difficult. So when I see people like that are hugely successful in another part of the world in their, in their life, professional life, whether it's an actor, you know, a finance person, a singer, whatever it is. I've got Seal, who's – I'm going to do one with Seal because I've played with him. Yeah. At the first ever challenge. And these people are, like, unbelievably accomplished, right, in what they do. And yet they're willing to go out there and basically be beginners at tennis and spend hours playing it to, like, make exponential improvement. I find that fascinating, and I find it incredible to talk to people like that and kind of trying to get in their mind of, like, why tennis? So that's really what, you know, my first um, bunch of podcasts are about. Hey, man, um, I I promise we will see each other down the road. And um, just thank you very much. Uh, peace to your family and all your people. And uh, you are released. That's it. All right, man. Listen, I thank you for having me on. And... Uh, it's awesome that you keep doing this. You're doing a great job. And you say hello to all my SoCal tennis buddies out there, okay? <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. All right, Patrick. All right, take it easy. Okay. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye.